Hello, and welcome to our Winship webinar, Updates in CAR T-Cell Therapy. My name is Javier De Jesus, and I'm the Senior Manager of Web and Digital Initiatives here at Winship Cancer Institute. We're glad that you're joining us today for what we're sure will be an informative and insightful presentation. During the presentation, I encourage you to post your questions in the chat, and we will address them at the end. Of the, at the end. Our guest today is Dr. Jean Koff. Dr. Koff is assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at Emory University School of Medicine. A board certified hematologist and medical oncologist, Dr. Koff specializes in the treatment of lymphoid malignancies. She is an active clinical investigator in the Bone, Marrow, and Stem Cell Transplant Center here at Winship Cancer Institute. Dr. Koff's academic focus is in epidemiology, outcomes and translational research in lymphoma with a particular interest in the intersection between autoimmune disorders and lymphoid malignancies. Dr. Koff, welcome and please take it away. Thank you so much, Javier, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to give some important updates on CAR T cell therapy in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This is an ever-expanding topic, um, and it's important that we stay on top of all the new data that's coming out and all the new ways that we can help our patients access these uh, novel and effective therapies. These are my disclosures. I will be discussing some non-FDA approved indications during my presentation, but these are largely related to ongoing clinical trials in this area. And this is just an outline of some of the topics I hope we can go over in detail. Um, first, I'll start off with a little review of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We'll talk about how CAR T cells work and treatment considerations when administering CAR Ts. We're gonna go over in detail the FDA approved application of CAR T cell therapy in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and then talk a little bit about future directions in this area. So I think most of the audience will be familiar with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a heterogeneous group of lymphoid malignancies and together makes up the six most common cancer diagnosed in men and in women in the United States. What makes NHL pretty tricky is that there are over 60 different subtypes and they all have somewhat different patterns of growth, uh, response to treatment, and uh, targetable uh, molecular changes or proteins. About 85% of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas arise from B cell precursors, and most of what we'll be talking about today will be those lymphomas that are known as B cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Each subtype uh, resembles a normal lymphocyte counterpart at a, at a particular stage of its physiologic development. And the way that we distinguish uh, between these 60 different uh, subtypes is through histology. So what the uh, lymphoma cells look like under the microscope, what cell surface markers they express. And we can look at that using immunohistochemistry or flow cytometry. And then we also distinguish between them based on molecular features, uh, in large part mutations and sometimes translocations. When we look at the different types of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, other than uh, B cell and T cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the next big breakdown between these diseases is between indolent lymphomas and aggressive lymphomas. Indolent lymphomas make up the majority of non-Hodgkin's cases. Um, these are uh, ca ca characterized by an indolent growth pattern, as the name suggests. Um, they're sometimes managed with watchful waiting. They are generally considered incurable, although they are very often uh, very responsive to treatment and can be adequately controlled with long durations of response, often without need for a therapy in those interims. The key subtypes that we think about in indolent lymphoma are the most common, which is follicular lymphoma, uh, followed by CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma, which are two different sides of the same disease, CLL when the disease is largely circulating in the bloodstream, and SLL when the disease is largely present in the lymph nodes. 
the less common types of indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma include marginal zone lymphoma and the lymphoplasmacytic lymphomas, the most common of which is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. The other large group of non-Hodgkin lymphomas are the aggressive lymphomas. And as the name suggests, these tend to grow rapidly and are often life-threatening. This is a double-edged sword because they, although they are life-threatening, they can be curable with chemotherapy. But as we all know, the patients who either don't respond to initial chemotherapy or who relapse after frontline uh, therapy uh, often have a very poor prognosis. The most common type of aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, of course, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And in recent years, uh, there has been some change to the uh, WHO classification of this disease. And what we had previously called double hit lymphoma often gets recategorized as high grade B cell lymphoma with uh, rearrangements of MYC and BCL2. And so we tend to think of DLBCL and these high grade B cell lymphomas as being very closely related. Um, also in that group is the premier primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, uh, and then of course, Burkitt lymphoma, much, much less common, and mantle cell lymphoma uh, often gets grouped in with the aggressive lymphomas, even though it can sometimes have an indolent growth pattern. So how do we treat these patients with either indolent or aggressive uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma that haven't responded to initial standard of therapy. And one technology that has really risen to the forefront in treating non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the CAR T cell. And the CAR T cell therapy acts as a type of cellular immunotherapy. But what is the CAR T actually? It's a type of drug that uses the cell as a drug. And the T cells, from, usually from the patient themselves, are engineered in a lab to express a stripped down, what I call Frankenstein version of the T cell receptor. And what this entails, as you can see here, is a combined extracellular domain that recognizes a target antigen. And in most of the technologies that we'll be talking about today, that target antigen will be CD19 on a B cell. Um, and it's coupled with an intracellular domain that activates the T cell to mediate cytotoxic killing. And so this targeted cytotoxic effect is independent of any of the antigen presenting cells or the MHC complex. You have the recognition end directly coupled to the business end so that these uh, CAR Ts are manufactured killing machines. Um, and the way that they're manufactured is like I said, you take the um, usually the patient's T cell and you deliver this chimeric antigen receptor via usually a lentiviral vector. It's delivered into the uh, CAR T um, in gene form and then is expressed um, as, as a protein on the surface of the CAR T. So the way this process works from uh, CAR T manufacture to infusion into the patient is, is this way. The T cells are acquired from the blood of the patient uh, in an apheresis center um, using the, the apheresis process. Um, and the T cells are extracted and sent to a specialized lab where they can be engineered into CAR T cells in in the way that I described on the previous slide, where the gene for the CAR um, is inserted into the, patient's CAR, uh, into the patient's T cells using the viral vector. These engineered CAR T cells are grown and expanded in the lab until there's a large enough dose that they can be expected to be effective in targeting and killing the patient's tumor. 
and then they are shipped back to the patient care site. The patient receives what's called lymphodepleting chemotherapy prior to the infusion of the CAR T cells. And this is mainly to, uh, to kill off the competing normal T cells in the body so that the CAR T cells have all the, the room and the resources to grow within the body and exert their cytotoxic effect. So after the patient has uh, received the lymphodepleting chemotherapy, the CAR T cells are infused into the patient where they hone to the tumor because they recognize the antigen, um, in, in many cases, the CD19, and they attack the cancer cells and kill them. This slide goes into some of the common side effects of CAR T therapy. Um, one of the most commonly known and the most commonly encountered is cytokine release syndrome. This is an inflammatory uh, syndrome that can present with initial flu-like symptoms and progress if untreated or severe um, into a shock-like syndrome with elevation in certain cytokine levels. Uh, we'll go over uh, a lot of the specific uh, side effects uh, related to CRS in ensuing slides, but some of the main side effects include fever, vascular leakage, and organ dysfunction, again, compatible with an inflammatory mediated syndrome. Usually uh, with most commercial CAR Ts, uh, this CRS arises within the first week or so after therapy, but it can have a variable uh, uh, onset and a variable course. We've gotten a lot better in learning how to manage uh, CRS as we've had more experience in this field with lots of new CAR-T products. And the cornerstones of management include IL-6 or IL-6 receptor blockade. Um, the most commonly used antibody that we use for that is uh, the, the drug tocilizumab. Sometimes we also use corticosteroids, and in some instances, we use other cytokine receptor antagonists if we can't control the CRS very easily. Neurotoxicity is the other key side effect of CAR-T therapy that needs to be considered. Um, it's also known as ICANS or immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome. And this set of, of side effects can manifest as anything from mild confusion all the way up to seizures and cerebral edema. The mechanisms by which the CAR-T uh, incite this type of toxicity is largely unknown, but we do know that we see increased incidence of neurotoxicity with an increased dose of CAR T cells in patients with older age and with higher numbers of prior therapies. The management uh, for low-grade neurotoxicity is largely supportive, but if a patient manifests with higher-grade neurotoxicity, we use corticosteroids, often dexamethasone. And in the center is a longer term side effect of CAR-T therapy, which makes a lot of sense if your CAR-T therapy works very well, that in addition to taking out the malignant B cells, that the T cells also attack, attack the normal bystander B cells. And this can result in B cell aplasia that often is uh, very long term. And in some of the original series where uh, patients with B cell ALL were treated with CAR T, lasts in what seems to be a permanent B cell aplasia. And so, as you can imagine, this can result in hypogammaglobulinemia since the B cells are the producers of your antibodies, which results in an increased risk of infection. And fortunately, this can largely be managed with infusion of IVIG. This slide is showing how we grade cytokine release syndrome. This grading scale has undergone some modification in the past few years. You can see it's much simplified where CRS is defined as having a fever um, and when this happens, we always make sure to rule out that there could be an infectious component to the fever. 
but CRS is defined as having a fever and some degree of hypotension and hypoxia um, with increasing grades having increasing um, severity of either hypotension or hypoxia. Like I mentioned before, even though we grade cytokine release syndrome based only on fever, oxygen levels, and hypotension, it can impact a variety of uh, different organ systems, especially if it is improperly treated. Um, we have here the, the mainstays, which are the constitutional symptoms that the patients will report. Um, you can have gastrointestinal symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as well as hepatic dysfunction. Rarely, we will see a rash associated with this uh, side effect. And as you can imagine, hypoxia is a mainstay. And so if, pa if patients become hypoxic with uh, higher grades of CRS, um, they can develop uh, tachypnea and even pulmonary edema with uh, capillary leak syndrome. Occasionally, we do see uh, coagulation disorders as well as renal dysfunction with CRS. Um, and for the patients who have issues with hypotension, like I mentioned, there can be uh, tachycardia, a capillary leak syndrome, and other uh, late, later effects if CRS remains untreated. One key takeaway about CRS is that the symptoms often mimic sepsis in that it is the body's um, hyperacute inflammatory response um, mediated by the CAR T cells, but the way that we treat CRS is quite different. Uh, although we treat empirically for uh, infectious uh, disorders, um, we are also thinking about dampening the inflammatory response with agents like the tocilizumab, which targets the IL-6, as well as uh, sometimes corticosteroids. So now we'll talk a little bit about which CAR-T therapies are indicated for which uh, disorders uh, in, in the lymphoma world. So the the subtype that is furthest along in terms of data and FDA approval for different CAR-T agents are the large cell lymphomas. And these include DLBCL, high-grade high B-cell lymphomas, uh, transformed lymphomas from follicular and primary mediastinal lymphomas. And the three products that are currently FDA approved um, are the axicaptogene silolucel or axicel, Tisagenlec Lucel, and the new kid on the block is Lysocaptogene Marilucel. And as you can see, these are approved in similar indications, and they have uh, somewhat different costinulatory domains in the intracellular region of the T cell. These are the clinical trials that led to FDA approval of these agents. Um, with Zuma-1 being the trial for Axacel, you can see an overall response rate reported of 83%. That's a little bit misleading because the response rate was queried at a pretty early time point. Um, what I really want to draw your attention to is the landmark overall survival, um, because one of the key considerations with CAR T cells is that in order to control the lymphoma, you have to have a long duration of response. So all of these have a pretty similar um, overall survival rate at one, one year, and, and the axi cell is the furthest along in, in terms of long-term data, and so they actually have a two-year landmark overall survival. But what you can see is even in this heavily pretreated population of large cell lymphomas, that you have encouraging overall survival rates of about 50%. And usually when I'm counseling patients, I tell them that for any of these therapies, um, for these CAR T therapies available for large cell lymphomas, uh, we have a, around a 30 to 40% chance that a patient will have a response and that that response will be durable over a long period of time, which is really what we're looking for in these patients who have relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma. We also wanna focus on the toxicity rates. 
you can see that the, the newer agent, the um, Lisa Captagene, has reported lower rates of uh, grade three and higher CRS and neurotoxicity. Some of this relates to the may relate to the product. There haven't been any head-to-head -head trials of these agents, but some of it also relates to the fact that um, by the time they were um, doing trials uh, looking at this agent, we had a much better understanding of how to manage CRS and screen for neurotoxicity and manage it. And so they may have benefited from um, that experience, um, knowing that we can use the tocilizumab earlier and knowing when it's most appropriate to use steroids for either CRS or, or neurotoxicity, thus preventing uh, advancement to grade three toxicities in this space. In the last year or so, um, there have been other subtypes of lymphoma that have been approved for uh, CAR-T therapy, and that includes mantle cell lymphoma. And the product approved for mantle cell is uh, brexacaptogene autolucel. And what you'll notice with both of these products on this uh, slide is that we have a much higher overall response rate and a higher complete response rate. And we have very, very encouraging uh, one-year overall survival rates uh, for these products. And some of that has to do with the disease process itself, um, that, that mantle cell and also follicular uh, may just be more responsive to this type of CAR-T therapy but also that these diseases are not as aggressive um, in growth and in, in life-threatening capabilities in most instances compared to relapse refractory DLBCL. So you can see here um, landmark overall survival at one year, 86% for mantle cell um, treated with this CAR-T product and at 93%, very encouraging for uh, relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma treated with Axacel. And again, notably, a very high complete response rate in the follicular patients who were treated on the Zuma 5 study. And what you can see here is that there are different CRS and neurotoxicity rates associated with each, with each different CAR-T drug. So what do we think about when we're considering a patient for CAR-T? You want to consider the tempo of their disease. Um, we, see, we want to make sure that their disease is relatively well controlled um, because they need to be able to, uh, uh, be able to wait between uh, the apheresis and the CAR-T manufacturing to be eligible for CAR-T. And often we will give patients bridging therapy um, to help, help control their disease while they're waiting for CAR T infusion. Uh, we also need to make sure that they, their CNS disease is under good control um, if we're considering CAR T therapy. The patient needs to have adequate cell counts because CAR T cell therapy is associated with uh, uh, cytopenias related to the LD chemotherapy and to some extent the CAR T cells themselves. And patients with history of DVT, bleeding, infection, or neurologic disorders are all at higher risk for adverse events with CAR-T therapy. We screen our patients for functional status both at uh, initial evaluation of, uh, for CAR-T therapy and at the day of CAR-T infusion to make sure that they will be able to tolerate the therapy. And then we also need to think about whether the patient has adequate social support because they um, are at risk for uh, side effects, uh, especially in the first month after CAR-T therapy. We have to consider reimbursement for these FDA approved therapies not given on trial. And uh, for the center that's administering the CAR-T, you need to make sure that they have tocilizumab available for acute CRS management. In terms of future directions for CAR-T therapy, there are many, many uh, trials looking at uh, this exciting therapy in different indications and targeting different antigens. I've listed a few of these here. Um, these are trials looking at targeting alternative antigens, including the B-cell marker CD20 um, and CD22, 
one area that we're very excited about at Emory it are agents targeting CD30 because these have applications not just for B-cell lymphomas, but for Hodgkin's lymphomas and CD30 expressing T-cell lymphomas. And then we also are excited about looking at whether CAR-T can be used not just in third-line therapy, but as a replacement for second-line standard of care, um, thus replacing potentially uh, high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant in the treatment of large cell lymphoma. And we've participated not only in the CAR T in some of the CAR T trials that led to their FDA approval, but we're also participating at Emory in trials that are comparing CAR T cells to uh, second line standard of care, such as the Belinda trial and the Transform trial. At Emory, uh, we're very interested in adding to uh, the development of novel CAR T's, and we have several researchers working to engineer their own homegrown CAR T's. A uh, clinical trial using homegrown CD19 targeted CAR T therapy for patients with non Hodgkin lymphoma is currently under development at Emory, with planned opening in late 2021. The ability to uh, administer homegrown CAR T therapy has a lot of benefits for patients, including a decreased turnaround time between the apheresis and the CAR T infusion, um, as well as expanded patient access to CAR T beyond the indications limited by commercial project products. And we're very excited um, because we have a, a brand new uh, cellular and immunotherapy core known as Excite. And this is the specialized clinical cell manufacturing facility that prepares our cell and immunotherapy products and allows us to uh, design novel CAR T's, but also to um, infuse homegrown CAR T uh, products into patients on our new clinical trials with the mission to provide cell manufacturing and consulting for the translation of these Emory-based research projects into early phase clinical trials. So the main takeaways from this talk that I hope you gleaned were that CD19 targeted CAR-T products are FDA approved in third line or greater therapy for large cell lymphomas, mantle cell lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma. I think we can expect ever increasing indications for CAR T therapy. And the patient selection and toxicity management are really key concerns when you're considering CAR T therapy in, in non Hodgkin lymphoma. This is our lymphoma team at Winship. All of these providers see patients in the outpatient setting, and many of them also take care of CAR T patients who are re receiving their infusion of product on the inpatient side. So there's a lot of overlap between these providers and the providers who are on our cell therapy team. Referrals um, to these providers can be made using this email address, bloodcancer at emoryhealthcare.org, or calling the number listed. That ends my talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions that uh, the audience may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ka, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a question. Uh, it says, uh, with one to two year survival of only 50%, is there any thought to the Justin cell dose? <clears throat> and the theory seems great, so why is survival as low as it is? Yes, yeah, so that's a million dollar question. Why is survival uh, not 100%? And there is still a lot of work being done at Emory and at CAR T centers around the world trying to better identify who are the patients who are going to respond to CAR T and who aren't. Because like I mentioned, at least in large cell lymphoma, there's a fairly consistent rate of about 30 to 40% of patients who will have long-term response. Um, and so we still haven't figured out the biology behind that or the patient factors that will help us better match who should get CAR-T as, as a therapy that is more likely to uh, result in long-term response. In terms of increasing the dose of the CAR-T therapy, in the phase one trials and in, in many of the early studies using these newer products, um, they tested the, the doses of cell therapy for dose limiting toxicities. And what they found is that CAR T cells infused 
with a higher dose of cells than what is currently approved had uh, basically dose limiting toxicities in large part the um, overwhelming CRS or even neurotoxicity um, that was even life threatening. So in a lot of the early CAR T trials, um, we actually saw some grade five CRS events um, related to dose of CAR T. And that's the reason that we don't uh, give higher doses. But with that said, with each new CAR-T product, and especially with the increased amount of knowledge we have regarding supportive care, um, we still, uh, in those phase one trials, are looking for the maximum tolerated dose with the idea that the highest dose possible that can give us a response and be tolerated by the majority of patients is, is the dose that we would want to use. Um, I do have a question of my own. You, you focused your presentation on the therapies available for the, uh, in the area of lymphoma. Uh, what other hematologic malignancies have FDA approved CAR T cell therapy drugs? So the very first, uh, the, the very first CAR T that was FDA approved was actually approved for B cell ALL um, in uh, in pediatric patients or in younger patients. And so um, that, that has been kind of the mainstay of CAR-T therapy. And then more recently, uh, CAR-T therapy has been approved for multiple myeloma. And our, our researchers and clinical investigators here at Emory uh, enrolled many, many patients on the CAR-T studies um, that ultimately led to that approval. Um, there, like I mentioned, there are many uh, clinical trials currently ongoing at Emory and elsewhere for expanded indications, including other CAR-T products for myeloma and other uh, and CAR-T products for patients with B-cell ALL who are older than 25, which is beyond what the current indication is commercially. Great. And um, you mentioned earlier in your closing slide, you know, how someone uh, would be able to refer a patient to our CAR T cell therapy program. Could you describe what a patient could expect once they're referred? Yes, yeah, so we've done a lot of work at Emory in the recent months um, trying to make sure that for our malignant hematology patients that they are seen very quickly um, in the clinic um, for the chief reason of uh, these patients often don't have a lot of time to um, decide what what sort of therapy uh, they need to go on to next. And so the way that a refer a referring physician can contact uh, our new patient referral team are, is by email or by phone. Um, and the, the information about the patient uh, will be collected and then the patient will be assigned to the provider who is, um, is an expert in that field. Um, and, and hopefully they will be seen very, very quickly, usually within two weeks or sooner if, if the provider feels that they need to be seen sooner because of clinical urgency. Um, the, the patient visit um, usually involves a very detailed visit with a lymphoma specialist who will review uh, the therapies that the patient has gotten before and evaluate the patient's candidacy for potentially CAR-T therapy or maybe a clinical trial or um, other, other uh, lines of therapy that may be available at Emory or elsewhere. And then in addition to the, uh, the medical oncologist or the hematologist evaluating the patient, as part of that visit, the pathology is reviewed at Emory. Um, usually uh, the, uh, if the patient is deemed a CAR-T candidate, then we have specialized cell therapy coordinators who will also meet with the patient and start the evaluation process um, to get the, the patient lined up for CAR-T if the uh, hematologist decides that that's the best uh, route of action for that patient. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question from the audience. It says, uh, where do you think uh, lysocell will fit in? And will there be issues with manufacturing slots with, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this, a, a, a BICMA, A-B-E-C-M-A? 
Yeah, so so I can't speak to uh, the ABACMA as much because that's that's more of my myeloma uh, colleagues' wheelhouse. Um, in terms of the Lisa cell, it's becoming a crowded field. Um, and we don't have head-to-head -head studies showing that one product is better than the other. Um, in many cases, uh, this may be an issue related to uh, patient payer. Um, it may be an, an issue related to manufacturing time. If we find that um, in our relationships with, with these three uh, CAR T manufacturers that there's a certain product that we know has a sh very short manufacturing uh, turnaround time, we may be more likely to use that product. Um, but right now, in terms of efficacy and safety, it's very hard to uh, compare these products head to head, um, not only because we don't have a head to head trial, but because, uh, as I mentioned, the the timing of the trials has been different for these products. We know more about supportive care now, um, but also the patient populations that these were tested in were slightly different. Um, there were slightly different indications between the three. So I think that's an evolving realm. Um, Emory uh, it is currently um, onboarding the Lisa cell onto, into our armamentarium of, of cellular therapy products. So it remains to be seen, um, at least commercially, how this is gonna fit into our practice. So thank you. And uh, one last question here, it's uh, also on survival. Uh, it says, how does survival with CAR-T compare with that for conventional um, so that is that is the question that is currently being asked by at least three uh, 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 late phase clinical trials of whether um, CAR T in the second line actually outperforms high dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant. So those those studies have just. Uh, just started to complete their accrual. So we won't have the um, interim, we won't have the interim data, uh, the survival analyses for a little while, but we expect to see those fairly soon in the next year or so. And so those trials will help us answer that question of whether CAR-T can in fact outperform auto transplant. Well, well with that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh end our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ka, for uh, joining us today and on such a wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, we are recording this session and we will make this available on our website. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Have a great week. Thank you.